And I wanted to begin by asking you uh, about something I've, I've noticed, especially on the online space and amongst young people, which is an increase in the popularity of so-called self-help movement. There'll be all kinds of YouTubers and books that are sold, but also in the intellectual space, people like Jordan Peterson, a lot of their popularity is driven by the by the sense of meaning that they're seen to reinvigorate people's lives with. Yeah. And I, I think the most astonishing thing about this is the, the demand for that kind of material. It says to me that we might be living through something like a, a crisis of meaning. And I wondered if you shared that opinion, and if so, what you think is causing it? That's Alex O'Connor, the Cosmic Skeptic. And today on Trinity Radio with me, Braxton Hunter, we're going to be looking at a discussion between Alex, the Cosmic Skeptic, and Bishop Robert Barron about meaning, death, purgatory, and whether God is a cosmic dictator. So Alex says there might be reason to believe that people are experiencing a crisis of meaning. And we'll get Bishop Robert Barron's reaction to that right now. Yeah, I do share that opinion. Uh, we're in such a culture of self-invention, you know, the priorities given to the ego to kind of invent its own values and even to invent itself. And the roots of that go back, I mean, go to Nietzsche, come up through Sartre and into Foucault and people like that, which has now become the default position of most young people in the West, I would say, that we invent ourselves, we invent our own values. And I think if you want to mention someone like Peterson, uh, he's appealing to, I'd call them ob objective values. And a meaningful life is one that's lived in some kind of purposive relationship to a value, I would say. That when you discover, you intuit a value, whether that's epistemic or aesthetic or moral, and then you, you order your life according to that value, you're living meaningfully. To me, it's an illusion to think you can invent your own uh, purpose. You can invent your own meaning. I think you discover them. And that's, those are the best moments in life, you know, and they're recorded in some of the, the great literature of the world, those moments when an aesthetic value appears, a moral value makes a demand on us, or an epistemic value appears, and we say, yeah, that's the truth, and I need to give myself to it. I'd also personally like to work into this discussion uh, a thought about how this will affect your everyday life and how you think about the things in your life. They get there a little bit, but I want to call it out specifically and talk a little bit about it that if your ultimate meaning is uh, to serve God or something like that in some particular way, if you find your meaning in a relationship to God, then that is going to order the values of the other things in your lives. And getting those values then disordered is going to cause problems. It's basically on the Christian worldview, if we understand that there's a creator and there is this objective meaning in the world and all that sort of thing, then when we look at life, we see that things have value. For example, there's a value to uh, playing video games for recreation, perhaps some stimulation, hand-eye coordination. If you're playing online, maybe with some friends, you get some sort of social engagement out of that. Th th there's some goods to playing video games, whether our parents thought so when we were kids or not. But though there is a value on, say, your favorite video game, uh, that value is not the same as your wife or your husband, let's say. So if you're someone who's about my age, and let's say you spend uh, uh, most of your time at home playing video games rather than with your family, and it's like you're not spending almost any time with your family, you're spending most of your time playing the favorite video game and you know who you are, well, what does this mean? This means that though the, va though the video game has value, your wife or husband also has value. And the value that your wife or husband has far exceeds the value of the video game. And so if you're spending all your time on the video game and ignoring your wife, well, then you're disordering the values. You put more of a value on the video game than should have been there. And you're putting far too little of a value on your spouse. And that should have been much higher from the beginning or is much higher in reality. You see this when it comes to things like alcoholism. If, uh, say, beer has a value, well, great. But if you become an alcoholic and you're abusing your wife or something like that, or you're just ignoring her or not taking care of your family, again, this is an example of taking something that might have value in it, but then saying, that I'm treating it like this thing is more valuable now than this other thing. And that understanding is going to undergird much of what we talk about going forward. And so when Baron talks about things like, oh, I recognize this is a true value, this is like, uh, you know, something incredibly beautiful or moral or whatever, then uh, in such a state, when I recognize such a thing, I, I have this desire to give myself to it. And what we're talking about there is you're recognizing where the values really sit and what really has higher values and then appropriately recognize 
recognizing those values so that you're highly valuing the things that are highly valuable and not highly value, highly valuing the things that have very little value or at least less than those other things. But then Alex brings up this great question. Uh, what about people that don't think there is any ultimate meaning? And so they just kind of make up their own meaning. I like philosophy. I like music. Do you think the people who say, well, I'm just going to invent my own meaning and purpose are essentially just coping with the fact that they're beginning to recognize that their worldview doesn't have any grounding for objective meaning. What does the bishop think about such people? Yeah, I, my, my guess is that when they say that, they don't really mean it. Uh, they are, in fact, in touch with objective value. But they're so enamored of, of the value of freedom, which, by the way, is a value. I mean, personal freedom is a great moral value. But if you valorize that to the nth degree, then you get into this problem. I, I think people that say I'm inventing my values, in fact, very often are intuiting objective value if you press them on it. Because um, we, kind of, we can't finally stay in that Sartrean space. Uh, go right back to existentialism as a humanism. You know, when he said existence precedes essence. I think that's now the default position of most people today in the West. But it, it, to me, that's just a, it's like a, it's a, it's a going nowhere position that my freedom invents who I am. No, my, my freedom finds itself in relationship to great values that call it and condition it and summon it to something higher. You know, that's when you're truly free. Yeah, so you're truly free when you understand the proper valuations. And the thing about this is freedom is a, a value. I, I think that's absolutely right. The problem is we place that freedom high above other things when the freedom, what it should do is as a valuable thing that we have an incredibly valuable thing. We, we take that freedom and we take advantage of the value that it has to hopefully hopefully be a part of the process to getting us to the things that we recognize as the most valuable things that there are. And by the way, this isn't a video about the pro-choice, pro-life sort of thing, but I will just say this, that often what we do there is we pit uh, values against each other, the value of life and the value of liberty or the value of freedom as we've been talking about it here. And so we decide uh, often what happens is an improper valuing. I think that freedom is incredibly value, valuable, and I think that life is incredibly valuable. But I think that among those two, life, the, the, the virtue of life, the good of life, life has this value that should give us, um, we should err on the side of life when it comes to issues like, say, abortion. And I know we haven't gone into all the different arguments and things about abortion. We have other stuff like that on this channel. But just to make the simple point that this is an example of where I think we order things wrong and that we act wrongly in response to it. Liberty, freedom, freedom over your own body is a good thing. But there are these values, like the value of life, that we have to take into consideration. And we have to ask, which one is the more valuable thing? Which one is the thing we should be holding on to, even in spite of the other one being present? And then, of course, when you are properly valuing things, you will be free in a much deeper sense in a way that we'll talk about in just a few moments. Yeah, I mean, I've previously compared it to the idea. Well, I, I think it's helpful to try and understand what what meaning means, right? Uh, yeah. These the term is often used interchangeably with something like purpose, and I think what we're talking about is something like a a, a non derivative reason to act or reason to be. This is what purpose is. Yeah. And so the idea of having a reason to act, if you invent your own purpose, what it seems like you're doing is inventing some kind of task to fulfill or mm -hmm. some kind of motivation to do something for its own sake. Yeah. It's like you, you don't actually have a real motivation to do something and that's why you do it. But the, the lack of any motivation causes you to create a task just for the sake of having a task to fulfill, yeah. which seems uh, a little circular, I suppose. Right. And we'd also, be, we'd also be committed to the view, for instance, that if one person decides to invent their value by counting the blades of grass in their garden every yeah. day until they die. And another person decides to find their meaning and invent their purpose by raising money for Oxfam and lifting thousands of people out of poverty, that both of those people's lives are as meaningful as each other. Yeah, and, that's, uh, and, and that just seems wrong. Yes, and that's the Sartrean problem. And, and Sartre himself like, knew it. If you say the authentic life on his terms is the one in which you know my freedom has authentically chosen its own value. Well, Sartre chose to be part of the resistance, but then how do you say the Nazi isn't authentic? The Nazi has chosen his value based upon his freedom. So how do you adjudicate those two things? And see, I would say you have to rely not on your self-inventing freedom, but on some objective value. And I would be able to say, I think, the Nazi is radically out of step with proper moral value, and the member of the resistance was in touch with it. 
So there you go. Here is the system in practice. Alex mentions the fact that you could take someone who's doing something incredibly philanthropic and there would be some sort of value to that sort of way of spending your life. On the other hand, you could count the blades of grass. I've heard people talk about memorizing the the names of the products on a grocery shelf every day until you just have it down and then starting over and doing it all again. That's how you spend your life. And the idea is, like Alex says, it seems obvious to us, something screams out intuitively to us that one of those things is way more meaningful than the other, right? And I think that that is an example of ordering, ordering what you consider valuable rightly. And then, of course, uh, Bishop Barron uh, takes it a step further, right? Not only is there no actual difference in how meaningful each of these things are, if there is no objective meaning, if it is something we just make up for ourselves, it's also true that if you decided to do what the Nazis did uh, versus some philanthropic thing, that, that would also not be more meaningful in some ultimate sense, right? It's just that uh, it's just that we chose this instead of the other thing because of subjective sorts of things. And if Mother Teresa and, and building wells for thirsty people and all that kind of thing, if, it, it, if there's no objective ultimate uh, facts about the matter, then, then it, doing that, digging wells for thirsty people in Africa is no more valuable or good or moral or anything like that than uh, what the Nazis did, right? But of course, this is obviously wrong. And what strikes us as wrong, I would say that what strikes us as wrong is we're getting the valuations wrong. We're putting the values wrong. We're assigning the wrong values to the wrong things. Mm. You said it, it's not about, it's not between theism and atheism but essentially choosing what it is you worship or right. choosing what it is that you follow. True worship or false because, worship. Right. That, because there has to be something, right? There right. has to be something motivating action. If there wasn't some fundamental uh, purpose or reason that underlies every other reason you have to act, right. then those reasons wouldn't exist. They don't have any power of their own accord. The, right. the, if you're motivated to go to work so that you can make money, Without the the reason for making money, which right. might be to you know have a comfortable life, yeah. the the reason of I want to make money doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't exist just right. on its own accord. It relies on something more fundamental, and uh, this entire chain must lead back to a first cause. It's interesting. It's quite like right. uh, arguments for the existence of God but in terms of final... cosmology or something, but it's about meaning. Yeah. First, I thought that was just fantastic. It's like it's like some of these uh, you know contingency type arguments or, or whatever, where you, there's, there's, you can't have um, an infinite regression, right, of explanations to this. Uh, it seems like if you start thinking about why you're doing any particular thing, like watching this video right now, or me making this video right now, and you just take it down a step of, well, why do I do that? Well, because I have this channel. Why do I have this channel? I have this channel because I want to spread the gospel. Why do I want to spread the gospel? I want to, because I believe it's true, and I, and I believe that I'm commanded to do it, and I do it out of love uh, principally for my fellow man. Oh, well, why do you want to do all those things? Why is that good? Well, because I believe that that's what honors God. Well, why do you you want to honor God. And it all goes back to ultimately, uh, I, I think it goes back to what you worship. And the idea here that I think is helpful, whether this is clear or not, I, th I think an important fact here to mention is when you're talking about what you worship, the reason it's important to talk about what you ultimately worship or what, what is the ultimate reason you do the things that you do is once you find yourself worshiping a particular thing, then how you value things might flow from that. And it's certainly true with God. If you come to val if you come to worship the Christian God, that is the beginning of valuing things properly in life, I think. Now, as they've said in this in this episode elsewhere, I think it's true that people will naturally find themselves doing I think that atheists who who uh, naturalistic atheists who perhaps don't believe ones ones of them that don't actually believe in some sort of uh, ultimate meaning or objective meaning as we talk about it as some of us as Christians, um, I st I still think they have meaning. Uh, just like it seems like Bishop Barron is saying, they still have meaning because they intuit it. They notice the meaning that's out there. But that doesn't mean that everyone values them properly. And so I think finding God and finding the truth in Christianity is where you begin to structure and value and assign values properly to all of these things. And I think there will be some intuitive force behind that. I want to shift gears based on yeah. uh, something that we were just talking about, which is death and death's inevitability. Is it possible for a Christian who believes that there is life after death to see human death as a tragedy? Well, not ultimately. I mean, I think we can see it as a tragedy within the framework of this world, but we, we hold to a divine comedy. I mean, we hold to an ultimate purpose to, to the world and to creation. So death, you know, we would tend to intuit as a, as a doorway to a higher 
type of consciousness, a higher realm of experience. I want to thank the bishop for the endorsement of my book, Death is a Doorway. So death, you know, we would tend to intuit as a, as a doorway. So it depends on how you define tragedy, I suppose. Not in, in the ultimate sense. I mean, we, we hold to a sort of comic view of the world. It seems difficult to be rationally upset at the passing of somebody who lives a good life and, and you know, you're pretty convinced is going to go to heaven. It seems difficult to, I mean, obviously it makes sense to be upset, but do you think there's an irrationality in being upset over it in the knowledge that such people aren't really gone and are in a better place where you'll be reunited with them eventually? Well, no, but there's upset and there's upset. I mean, you could be upset in the immediacy and uh, it, it, your, your psychological pain in, in losing someone you love, of course you're upset. And then there's upset in the ultimate sort of cosmic sense. And I would hope that a, a believing Christian would avoid that sort of desperate view. But it doesn't mean we're not upset at, at the immediacy of the loss of someone we love. Yeah, I don't disagree with what the bishop says here, but I do want to add uh, to make it perhaps more clear that when I think about this, like my father, I think I'm the exact person to talk about this. I've had many close people close to me die, but also my father currently is struggling with uh, prostate cancer and is away from me and the rest of our family just there with my mother in Jacksonville, Florida, and is um, going through a therapy uh, that is going to last for, uh, it's, it's, by the time it's over, it will have lasted for three or four months. And uh, so I'm thinking about my father's life uh, because he has a bleeding disease. His heart actually stopped not uh, when they were doing colonoscopy to try to figure out exactly what was wrong with him. And I've thought many times about the passing of my parents and people like that who are really close to me. I'm thinking about it right now. And what I find uh, to be realistic about this is, yes, the Bible says um, uh, in First Thessalonians chapter 4, I think, uh, that we're not to despair as other people who have no hope. So do we get sad when people die? Yes. Well, how's that reasonable? He says, uh, the bishop says something like, well, yeah, sure, in our human existence or whatever, I, I would just put it like this. It's just put it straightforward. I agree with him, but I just put it straightforwardly. Is to say it like this. Um, when my parents, if my father dies today, uh, I'll be sad. I'll mourn. I'll grieve. Not because I'll never see him again but because I won't see him for potentially decades. If I leave out of town and go away from my wife right now for uh, two weeks, let's say, which would be extended for the amount of time I'm usually away from her, um, I'll be sad. Not because I'll never see her again. Well, that's silly. Of course I'll see her. See her in two weeks. Uh, but I'm sad because I won't see her for two weeks. And so that's kind of the way it is. Christians are sad, just like anybody else is sad. We won't see these people again for the rest of our lives. But that doesn't mean that, that, that we don't still love the hope that we have that we will see them again one day in the future in heaven. It's just, it's not despair. I, I, I classify despair as a state of hopelessness. There's no hope. Um, th there is still hope. And so we still have that. And that's how a lot of people get through difficult times like that, as everyone knows uh, about Christians. But it's still the case that I'll grieve, I'll mourn, I'll be sad in the interim, because that's potentially decades without someone that I really, really love. So why not, if nearing the end of your life, you can apologize, and as long as you do so sincerely, find your way at least to purgatory and potentially to heaven, why not console yourself or consign yourself to a life of hedonism and base pleasure and just wait until your deathbed to really contemplate these ideas? Wouldn't it be rational no. for a person to, no, to put that off for as long as they can? No, that's childish because, in fact, the life you're describing is a terrible life and is a, a painful life and a life that leaves you both physically, emotionally, and spiritually in a destitute condition. And so to say, oh, I'm going to do all that and then at the last minute <laughs> is just counterproductive. No, if you want to start right now living a life that's that's joyful and spiritually uh, alert and all that. So no, no, that, that would be silly. Yeah, go ahead and start participating in the kingdom as soon as you can. This is one of the reasons like when people say, you know, well, what if it is like William Lane Craig or Billy Graham suggested as a possibility that people who never hear the gospel, um, those people will be judged based on the light of revelation that they did have, that God knows that they have, how much they did know about God, given nature and the world around them. Perhaps God will judge them in such a way on, on those basis. Um, others will say, well, then that takes all the motivation out of evangelizing these people and going overseas to reach them and blah, blah, blah. Well, no, it doesn't. If all you think that the Christian life and salvation is about is fire insurance so that you don't go to hell, then I still don't think that has any force. I still think there's things to say about that. 
But the, the bottom line at the very least is you we evangelize them not just to get fire insurance, but so that they can know about the kingdom of God and go ahead and start serving God right now while they are on this earth during this earthly existence before those things uh, come to an end. And so I would say that, that you're thinking about Christianity wrong if the only reason you're thinking about being a missionary to people or telling people about Jesus is so is just so that they don't go to hell. That is a great reason to tell people about Jesus. But the truth is that uh, the, the, the best reason to become a Christian is to love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself, and to begin serving in this incredible kingdom of love for this incredible king of love. So likewise, I would say here, if even for someone who has heard the gospel, why you want to start living the Christian life right now. You want to start being a part of the kingdom and, and doing kingdom things and loving the king of love right now because there's no better time to start. It's not just that we do all that stuff in the hereafter. The people of God exist on this and the other side of the grave. And so we are very much uh, serving in the kingdom right now. And, and if you ever think, that you're willing to serve the king and bend the knee to the king. You don't want to wait till, you want to do that as soon as you can, start serving this incredible king. The second thing that I want to say about this that I do think is very, very important is, and I would imagine that, that perhaps Alex might suggest this to himself as a critique of, his, of, of the question that he raised. Because after all, he's raising questions to kind of tee up um, Bishop uh, Barron to kind of answer. But I think he might suggest this at some point to say something like, well, if you're the kind of person who says, I'm just going to be a hedonist until my final moments. And then after that, I'll, I'll, I'll repent and trust the Lord Jesus. And then it'll all be good. And I will have gotten all the earthly riches and I'll also get all the heavenly riches. I agree with what Bishop Barron has just said, that that doesn't work. We think that path leads to death. But even if you don't think that path leads to death. The truth is that that doesn't sound like the kind of person that will that that is willing to uh, submit to the king and to commit to him. Uh, maybe they get to that point by the end of their life, but it just seems odd that you would say, okay, here's my plan. I'm basically going to, let's, let's say it like this. I'm going to rip God off for most of my life. <laughs> I'm just going to live for myself and then I'm going to and not do anything for his kingdom. And then right at the end, I'm going to turn. That doesn't sound like a heart that, 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 um, that is sincere toward repentance, toward becoming a part of this family. Now, I'm not saying I can judge. I can't. I don't know what's going on in someone's heart. But I think we, we would look at that and say, well, that person doesn't seem like they really care. It seems like they're just in it for themselves. And that sort of person doesn't seem to be the humble sort that is willing to sincerely bend the knee to the king. So what I want to do now is move on to this clip that I really like here at the end about Christopher Hitchens and how he talked about God as though he was this, if he existed, he'd be like this celestial North Korean dictator. And so uh, I was actually surprised at some of the stuff that was said here because I know that Alex um, has some affinities or at least used to really appreciate Christopher Hitchens. And so uh, let's hear what they say here. Yeah, it's it's interesting to... To, to think on that, the idea of human beings not giving anything to God or not being able to take anything away from God. I, I mean, for me, I think that the problem with tyranny is the tyrant. Yeah. The, the reason why tyranny is bad, the reason why it's bad to have an authoritarian dictator is because of the corruptibility of human beings. Yeah. It seems to me that if there were a person or a being who genuinely knew you better than you knew yourself, genuinely wanted the best for you, and genuinely knew how to get the best for you, then it would be perfectly irrational for you to not do what they say all the time. Right. And that this shouldn't be described as tyranny, but rather right. something like genuine, enlightened advice that you would be foolish not to take. Right? I mean, this is what I love about Alex. Whether he buys this or not, he's perfectly willing to follow it and you know poke around in it and see if it's consistent. And if he thinks what you're saying sounds like it makes some sense, He'll say so. I love that about you, Alex. And I, I know you're not saying that you, you're you granting this, but I, I just, I, I love this humility. Right. That's why the psalmist can say, you know, Lord, I love your law. I meditate on it day and night. The law is not some imposition on me. I love your law. It's like a, when you're learning how to play golf and someone's giving you proper instruction and it's getting into your body and now you know how to hit the darn ball. I, I love the law. Give me more of it. Give me more of the law of golf. And I'm, if I'm living just in my own space, I'm going to golf any way I want to. I'll be the worst golfer in the world, right? So th that's a better metaphor for like religious law. And that's why when the Lord says, I will write the law in your heart, that's like a golfer. I finally got it in my body. I finally have the laws in my body. So that's what God wants to do. He wants to write the moral law in my, in my heart. I love this. I love this. This is incredible because I think a lot of Christians also think about how is it that whenever I like if I if I the rules, the, the you know, the law, you know, all these kind of things, 
how is it that those make me free? How is it that submitting to Jesus makes me more free? How is it that I'm a bond servant to Christ and yet now I'm more free than if I didn't uh, have a God? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't uh, submit to this God. I didn't recognize this God. How am I more free by the imposition of rules and those kind of things? I think some Christians can kind of think about that and think, oh, that sounds a little weird. How is there true freedom in Christ? How, how are we free from sin? How does this all work? And I think what he says here is a great analogy. If you're playing golf, and for those that have tried to play golf, I'm not a golfer, but I did take lessons for a while and played with some guys at our church when I was pastoring. And it, you think that you just be able to walk up and hit that ball. I mean, and... Honestly, it's not whether you can hit the ball straight. At first, you can't really hit the ball. You hit the grass, you hit next to the ball. It, it's it's very difficult. And you really have to learn how to grip the the, you know, how to how to grip the club, how to do all these things, how to hold your body. And then when you have all of that kind of inside of your head and inside of your muscle memory, it's all the rules. These are all rules, you know, it's really hard, but then after you have all of that, you're now free in a new way because the laws of golf have made of you someone who now it's kind of written on your heart to use the analogy the way he does. Now these rules and laws are kind of written into your body, so to speak as a golfer. And now you have freedom to play the game much more freedom than you ever had before in, in the right and most important sense. And I just think that's, that's great. So let's let him continue. Yeah. It's, it's like a, a wonderful and strangely paradoxical sense in which you can become more free or yes. more enabled by restricting your behavior, Quite much right. like how by restricting yourself from going to smoke some cigarettes, right. in a sense, you actually become more free by restricting right. the amount of things yeah. that you can and do. Another great example, another great analogy is anyone who tells, well, I want to be free to do whatever I want. So if I want to buy and smoke cigarettes, I should be able to do that. And then of course you do that. And then guess what? Now you're a slave to nicotine. And then you go to the gum and then you go to the tabs and then you go to the patch and then you go to vape and then you do all these different things. You're a slave, man. You're a slave. And uh, what this allows for is, is this freedom to escape that, rise above that. And even though it means you're now taking on a rule and a rule that isn't easy to keep, guess what? Now you're free in a new and more important way. See, freedom is a great spiritual metaphor up and down the tradition because our attachments make us unfree. And when I'm freed from my attachments, I'm freed for that thing we first talked about. This realm of objective value begins to open up to me in a fresh way. As long as I'm in my little world and I'm hung up on how do people think about me and how am I doing, and then I never, the world of objective value doesn't open up to me. It's like light pollution. I never see the stars. But when I get rid of all that clutter and, and distraction, I can actually see the stars. Mm. And this is what the the tyrant of Christopher Hitchens' description is actually doing. It's not do this or else I'm going to punish you, but do this because this is the right thing for you. Trust me, do this and, and things will clear a way that will enable you, a whole world to open up to you. That would be the, the right way to read it. Fantastic. Um, but I would be remiss if I close this without saying that uh, the bishop here is a Roman Catholic, and I'm not. And one of the things that was a part of this conversation was a discussion of purgatory. And so I want to say a couple of things about purgatory. I, I think uh, Alex actually correctly questioned him on this. Like, where, you know, why, you know, why should I believe this? Is it the Bible somewhere? And he talked about it, and he said some good things. Uh, and I, I encourage you to click the link in the description and go listen to the full discussion because it's fantastic. But I just want to say this. Um, I think that, that the idea of purgatory, I will grant that the idea of purgatory has some evidence, a little evidence in its favor. I don't think there's strong biblical evidence. And, and some of the things that Catholics might point to from their Catholic traditions um, are not things that I as an evangelical would have any particular reason to point to. So I'm kind of left with, well, hey, I want to know what the Bible says about this. But I will admit that, there's, that there is a philosophical way of thinking about this that I think does make some sense out of a doctrine of purgatory. Jerry Walls has talked about this. And it's the idea that, uh, you know, we Christians believe that you're justified. And then you begin this process of sanctification where you're becoming more and more like Jesus. And that seems to be important. I mean, we all kind of think that this process of sanctification is supposed to be important. All right. So if you have, let's say you have a woman who becomes a Christian at nine years old, is a nine-year-old girl, and then she lives till she's 99 years old. And she's tried, uh, she's, she's been walking with Jesus. She's been uh, studying the word of God in the community of faith. Uh, you know, she's philanthropic, she's mission oriented. And at 99 years old, she dies. Okay. There's been a lot of sanctification happening here. She's had a long time, many years to try and become more and more like Jesus as the Holy Spirit makes her into what she ought to be. 
But then you have a guy who, let's say he's used and abused people all over the place, and, and he becomes a Christian one day. He's only lived for self. He's only hurt other people. He becomes a Christian one day, and then he dies in a car accident. He hasn't had nearly the amount of time to live that process of sanctification that this woman has. He's had almost none. If this process of sanctification is supposed to matter, if it means something, if, if, if that's a good thing, if it's an important, if it's a necessary thing, then it must continue somewhere prior to glorification. So after death, where does this young man and perhaps even the 99-year-old woman, where do they go? Well, perhaps they go to this purgatory where they continue to become more and more like Christ. Now, so I get that there's some sort of like, if you appreciate the doctrine of sanctification and you look at it played out, then it seems like there might be some benefit of thinking about it playing out in purgatory. But that's about all I get with this. That's about all, all as far as I can go, because I don't think that there's a strong biblical case really at all for purgatory. And so as a result of that, I have to part here with Bishop Barron. But I wanted to point that out because it is a part of the discussion. And here's the thing, too, that, that, that I think is good here. Uh, the bishop mentioned at some point that the afterlife or, or this after death type stuff has a lot to do with justice. And I think that's so true. In fact, I think for those of you out there who already believe that there's a God, you already believe in theism, you just perhaps don't know uh, about this afterlife stuff, or maybe you don't know which God it is. I think you can at least get to, it seems reasonable to believe that there's some kind of an afterlife. And the reason that I think that's reasonable is to say, okay, it seems like there is this God and has given us this sense of morality and meaning and all of that. And we know that justice is not always borne out for the abused or the abuser here on earth. So if you have a maximally good God, a maximally just God, and we can see that justice doesn't happen here on earth, then it gives you good reason to believe that that justice must be borne out sometime at some place else in the, perhaps in the afterlife. Listen, there's more great stuff that I wanted to cover here, but I didn't. You can get that by clicking the link and listening. I think that what uh, Alex has to say about Jeffrey Dahmer is particularly uh, important to this discussion. It's a question that I get asked all the time. And I think that what he ends up saying and what the bishop ends up saying are very helpful for that discussion. And so I hope that you'll go check that out in the description. And with that, I'll see you next time on Trinity Radio. Radio.